Welcome to the Together for Good podcast brought to you by Bethany Lutheran Church in Cherry Hills Village, Colorado. Today's episode is a conversation between myself and Pastor Gary. We sit down to talk some Pentecost. More specifically, we're talking about the Holy Spirit. This coming Sunday, as you may or may not know, is Pentecost Sunday. And we read the same story every year from Acts chapter 2, where it's about the time that the Holy Spirit descended upon the disciples who were gathered in Jerusalem and sent them forth into the world. It's the birthday of the church, if you want to be specific. And so, Pastor Gary and I, we spend our time talking about the Holy Spirit. What What is this third work? What are the theological implications and the implications for our daily life and walk of faith? It was a cool conversation. It was a lot of fun. And I hope that it's helpful and brings you just some new perspective on this strange person of the Trinity that we often forget to talk about, if I'm being honest. So here it is, a conversation just in time for Pentecost with Pastor Gary and myself. Hello, everyone. Welcome. We're here sitting down. It's me and Pastor Gary. And Pentecost Sunday is coming up this Sunday. And we thought it would be a good idea to sit down and talk about the Holy Spirit. Because uh, the story we're going to hear on Sunday is about the time that the Holy Spirit a- appeared for the first time. And we'll hear another reading where Jesus predicts that the Holy Spirit's going to be coming after him. And it's kind of the forgotten person of the Trinity, at least <laughs> within the Lutheran Church, wouldn't you say? I think that's probably true because there are times when we almost want to downplay the Spirit because we think that is, interestingly enough, called Pentecostal. (laughs) Yes, that's true. Yeah. It's funny how those words link together, isn't it? Yeah, certainly there are other uh, Christian denominations that really get into the Holy Spirit. The Lutheran Church is probably not one of them. Right. And partly because we sometimes as Lutherans look at churches and go, they're only interested in the Spirit. And they yeah. almost make Jesus become the spirit rather than the spirit come from Jesus, if that makes sense. Oh, yeah, that's a really good way of putting it. But but that being said, too, that's why we want to at least like kind of illumine more about all of this, sure. too, because there's some really good stuff as it relates to the Holy Spirit that even the Lutheran Church still uh, puts its stake in the ground with. <laughs> Absolutely. It, we don't mean for it to be the forgotten person in the Trinity. Um, So, yeah, why don't you had a really good point in our pre-conversation, kind of how you understand this. So let's hear a little bit about that. Yeah, one of the things I look at is the Trinity itself. And so it's a good point or a good starting point to talk about the spirit because it's really easy to identify the God of creation. All you have to do is open your eyes. If you're a person with sight, you can experience a creation. And even if you're a person with only touch or smell, whatever it is, Mm -hmm. you experience the creation. It's really easy to experience Jesus. You look around, it's on a, you see the cross or a crucifix and it's so evident. And yet the spirit then becomes a, how do I know that's there? And what I think about the spirit as a person of the Trinity is to realize that uh, when I'm next to a stream that is kind of flowing, especially if there seems like it's kind of lively, uh, uh, you know, the babbling brook, or if I'm on a mountaintop or in a hospital room when my kids were born, to me, the power of those moments, I would say, were very spiritual. Mm -hmm. And I don't normally look at, at a babbling brook and think, wow, the God of creation is so majestic, not necessarily. And I might think that on the top of a mountain when you look out, but I realize it's the spirit that puts that thought into my own soul. At least that's how I would talk about that. Yeah, and you know, it's really good because that's very, that's actually, that's very, very scriptural in a lot of ways. I feel like that's part of what Jesus talks about. You know, we'll hear the reading on Sunday, but that there's going to be this presence of God after Jesus. Right. And that's very much like how we could understand the Holy Spirit is it's the it's the continuation of God's presence. Jesus was a living, breathing human being who we have real stories uh, written down about him and what he did. And now the Holy Spirit is kind of that continued sense of Jesus's presence with us, that continued sense of God's presence in these holy spiritual moments. Sure. And and Which is really fascinating because when you use that word spiritual, one of the phrases I always think of is how there's many people these days who say, yes, I'm spiritual, but not religious. And I get what they're saying with that phrase. And yet for me, 
it's a lot of our religious rituals and liturgy and holidays and traditions that are deeply spiritual to me <laughs> because they're connected with this long, you know, story of faith and this right. huge community of faith that's been enlivened by the spirit for thousands of years. And now I'm getting to be a part of it and right, just explaining and describing all that. There's something more going on. And that's what I would call some deeply spiritual moments even though they're also, yes, religious. So you, you can do both. You really can. Trust right. Me. <laughs> and, and the fact is, I think what a lot of people mean is when they're not religious, it means they don't attend a religiously organized church. Totally. Worship service totally. is kind of what they mean with that because to say you're spiritual means you turn yourself over to something. Yeah. And I agree. It's okay to have a spiritual thought, but I'd much rather have a spiritual experience. And if... You say, I don't go to church because I don't have a spiritual experience there. Then you just need to find another church. <laughs> That's really the That's answer. That's a good point, there. actually. Yeah, you seriously. Uh, because it is that that ongoing presence of the Spirit of God. And, and it's also important to know that as religious people, that you can have spiritual experiences in other avenues, too, as Absolutely. you already described. Sure. On, on a mountaintop by a stream, we encounter God in all sorts of different places right. and ways. And that's that's the spirit. That's the presence of the spirit, which is really, yeah. I'm sure I'm sure we could share all sorts of stories to that effect that are just powerful, um, to their own degree. Sure. But as we talk about that, Nate, take us into the sense of the spirit and the dimensions it takes on, even as we talk about the language that the Bible uses for spirit. Yeah. Yeah. Great point. So one of the the ways that spirit often appears within the scriptures is this Greek word pneuma which is very closely related to breath. And so one of the cool things that I'd like to point out, I did this with God's Word for the Week, our Monday morning Bible study. We read uh, Genesis chapter 1, huh. verses 1, 2, and 3. And in that, it talks about, in the beginning, um, God created the heavens and the earth, the, the whole idea. But it talks about there was a breath or a wind from God that hovered over the chaos, and then God spoke. And that's how creation began. So even you know, Christian scholars will say, even in the very first verses of Genesis, <laughs> you see mention of some sort of wind, some sort of breath of yeah. God. And that, that word pneuma is very closely related with all of this. And so where that can be very spiritual and powerful for me too, is just this recognition that God is as close as the next breath that I take. Yeah. That, that that is a, a real presence of the spirit within each and every living being um there's another uh greek or no it's, it's actually the way that the hebrews talk about it or it, within the hebrew language the name for god that god yeah. gives moses is yahweh and, and what what a lot of uh hebrew rabbis have written about over the years is that that name yahweh actually is very similar to the sound of human breathing yeah. that it, that it has this real airy breathy Yahweh. And so that's how they talk about it as well, is that with each breath, we confess the name of God. Mm -hmm. um, and I just think like, when you start to see breath as something spiritual, as connected to the Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. there's a lot of really powerful um, realities that, that come out of that, to just recognize how integrated God is into every moment of your day, whether you recognize it at the moment or not, God's still there and present. Right. And so just a little snippet, because we're not going to give away Sunday, because we really sure. want you to take care. But, but in that Acts passage that we'll read for Pentecost, it said, and there was the sound of a violent wind mm -hmm. or a violent spirit, although we don't think of the spirit as violent in that case. <laughs> but whatever it was, there was a power of God that draws us together. Yes. And it not only draws us together, but it also pushes us out, right? Wind oh, has yeah, the cap right. capability to do both of that. Yeah. And you see, again, we don't want to get ahead for Sunday, <laughs> uh, but you see both of that in the Acts passage and just in the way that the church has operated over the years. The church is all about coming together so that we can be sent out. Yep. And that is also how, how wind often works. It can pull you together or it can push you to the corners of the earth. And that's yes. exactly how the Holy Spirit is working and operating within us, within the church. Yeah, that's for sure. Then we also can look at the way we try to identify the spirit. And there are some people for whom the Trinitarian language becomes very gender specific. And so there are really appropriate places where we'll talk about the God of the Trinity as being 
creator, redeemer, and sustainer. Mm -hmm. And sometimes when I think about that, I go, all right, so what exactly is being sustained then by what we might say by the spirit? Is, is it I'm being sustained? Is it creation itself that is being sustained? It is the works of Jesus that are being sustained? Yeah. What's, what's the power of the spirit and what is being sustained? Yeah, that's a great question to think about, too. Because in the same sense as well, I often view the Holy Spirit not just as the one that sustains us, but that changes things and, and oh, mixes sure. us up, too. Again, going back to the, the Pentecost story, it seems like the disciples were pretty sedentary <laughs> until the Holy Spirit showed up and kind of shook the snow globe, so yeah. to speak. But so tell me about, I mean, how, do you, how, do you, how have you come to terms with that in terms of understanding sustaining? You know, it's very interesting because when I use that in a blessing, instead of saying Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, if I would use Creator, Redeemer, and Sustainer, I think it feels very personal. Like I feel like I'm giving a personal message to you yeah. that the Holy Spirit will be there to sustain you and maybe what I would say is empower you. I think yeah. is another way to to think about that. And oftentimes we even talk about uh, equipping people. And I would understand that in a very personal level. But I also wonder if we're, we are called by the Spirit then to sustain creation itself. Certainly as we talk about the nuances and the church becoming such an important factor in environmentalism, yeah. of understanding the gift of creation that we're called to sustain it. But I also think the other point then is we're called to sustain the church as the body of Christ. That's a part of what our great call is to be the people who realize the church has a future because God isn't going anywhere. And if we believe that we are sustained, it should take away a little bit of the consternation we have about the church sometimes. Yeah. I mean, we were talking before we started recording about the Denver Post put out an article two weeks ago, I think it was, just saying, like, the church is dying, <laughs> yeah. uh, which, 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 it might have been the first time the Denver Post wrote about that, but I swear I've read an article <laughs> oh. like that for generations yes. <laughs> in all sorts of publications. Yep. Um, I think they just need a way to talk about the church. But I mean, I'm not worried about it. That, that was, yeah. That's always my reaction. I think it's to your point because sure. I believe in the Holy Spirit as a sustainer. Right. Is that the, the, the power of God is so much more than analytics or, or whatever metrics they might be using to come to their conclusions. Right. And case in point, look at the last 2,000 years. There's been a lot of tricky situations for the Christian church over those 2,000 years. Sure. Yet here we are. Right. Look at, I mean, even here at Bethany, look at the last 16 months. It hasn't been the yeah. simplest, most straightforward, but we have been sustained by the faithfulness of members who were enlivened by the Holy Spirit. I mean, exactly. God has been looking out for us in so many different ways, um, and we'll continue to do so. We, mm -hmm. we can just, I think you were saying something effective, like you, you, have, you can just have faith in this or, or, or not. <laughs> right. You can either believe God's promises or not. And if the church is the bride of Christ, I don't think God's looking for divorce anytime <laughs> soon, you know? And that's not to say that, I mean, I know you and I, we would never just be like, well, yeah, God will just take care of it. No, oh, we're still right, going right, to be right. informed and strategic and forward thinking and yep. creative and all of those pieces. But we ultimately trust that, yeah, when things look dire or difficult, God will provide a way. God will find a way. Yeah. Very different than saying a congregation will close and the church will die. Correct. Those are two very, very different phrases. Congregations go through all kinds of nuances and transformations in their time. A lot of those transformations, when they're led by the Spirit, usually yeah. <laughs> become really, really positive transformations. And yeah, that's a really great point, too. I always like to bring up the fact that every single church the Apostle Paul started is now closed. <laughs> However, the church as a whole is flourishing because right. of the original work that, that Paul did and sure. others as well. It's always just a reminder that we are part of a much, much bigger story uh, than just our individual congregation. Yeah. That, that the Spirit has been telling a much, much bigger story across generations and geographies for thousands of years. And that'll continue. And it will. So that's where I think that idea of the Holy Spirit as sustainer brings me the confidence to continue doing what I'm doing. Yeah. You know, if I were, um, if I were trying to open a, an assembly line or, or a, a manufacturing plant today, 
I probably wouldn't start by saying, I wonder if the rotary phone will come back, you know, and start <laughs> making those just, just to see if all of that could come together. And sometimes I think that's what people want of the church. They want us to get back to the days of the rotary phone. Well, that's not going to happen. So part of it is to look to God's future for the church and the way that that will happen. I believe people talk about it. And it sounds trite because we can sometimes feel like we say it all the time. But it's not really. It's actually very, very powerful is to say when those those avenues, when that future is spirit-led or spirit-driven, there is tremendous power and hopefulness in that. Yeah, I, it's funny that your example you used. My, my friend is a pastor, and she told me a great story. She's, this was probably in like 2009, and she's pastor of a church, and they had a, um, the, the council treasurer who did an excellent job but did it all by hand. Oh, yeah. And she was trying to convince him, like, you know, like, we could be a lot more efficient if we used some of these computer systems. <laughs> and he, he said to her at a council meeting, he's like, are you telling me you really believe these computers aren't going away? <laughs> she said, she's like, yeah, I really think that they're here to stay. And that convinced him. And they eventually moved into a digital format for that type yeah. of stuff. But I mean, yeah, <laughs> it's a, it's, we, we have to make these changes too. But that's also, right, the Holy Spirit is a sustainer. But like I was saying as well, sometimes the Holy Spirit pushes us out and, yeah. and transforms things and shakes the snow globe, so to speak. And that's the work of the Spirit too. You, you look at a lot of the big moments of change within the history of the church, and you would say those have been Holy Spirit-inspired moments. Mm-hmm. I'm sure that that's part of how Martin Luther would have described his entire endeavor to reform the church of his day. Right. You, you know, like he felt moved and empowered by the Spirit to see these changes take place within the church that he knew and loved. And as a result of that... So much enlivening and change happened well beyond even his influence. You know, it it kicked off a whole bunch of other people to make their critiques and start out on their path. And and that's, yeah, that's how the Holy Spirit works as well. It's It's a creative force as well as a sustaining force. I think that's really the key is to understand that the Spirit takes us back to the roots of creation, where out of chaos can come something beautiful, miraculous. You know, from that can come a presence of God so powerful that it needed to be with us. And maybe that's what we would say, you know, well, Jesus was with us for a time. And we can say, well, that's when God was with us, Emmanuel. And and we conjure all that up. But I think what we have to realize is God was with us in the flesh. But now we talk about the spirit. Mm -hmm. We don't talk about God not being with us any less powerfully. And in fact, if you think about unleashing the power of the Spirit, it can travel a lot farther than uh, a God can find in a human body can. Yeah. No, that's a really good point. That, that yeah, the Spirit needed to, to, to set out to go to the corners of the earth. <laughs> right. Yeah, Jesus only could log so many miles in those sandals. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, and it's one of the ways I've heard the season of Pentecost described, since mm. that's what we're leading into. Pentecost is super long. Yeah. It, it's start, this is the last season in the church here, <laughs> yeah. and it starts on Sunday, and it'll go all the way until after Thanksgiving. But the the season of Pentecost, we usually the, the day of Pentecost, we'll, we'll, you'll see the color red because mm-hmm. it's the fire and the flame and all of that. But the season of Pentecost is often the color green, and the way that they referred to it in my kids' Sunday school class <laughs> in days of yore was the green and growing season. Yep. And I really like that because, because the image of a plant really does get at what we're talking about in that like mm. a plant has roots and so we're sustained and we're grounded and yet a plant grows up and expands beyond. Yeah. And that's very much so exactly this, this creative yet sustaining force right. is, is what's at work within us, within our church and what this whole next season is all about. Yeah, in a, in a way, a plant's calling is not to be rooted. It's because a plant is rooted that it has the strength to flourish. That's that would make for a good sermon. <laughs> <I know. laughs> so, well, maybe about that fourteenth Sunday of Pentecost yeah. when we're really wondering what to do with that. Remind we'll me. We'll get. <laughs> yeah, we have a lot of weeks to try it out. Well, and uh, Pastor Gary and I will be preaching together this Sunday. Yeah. Something fun for Pentecost. We'll do a dialogue sermon. And that you might hear some of these pieces mentioned again, but we're going to try and make that unique as well. Uh, but we hope that this was informative and helpful and that you have a new appreciation for 
the spirit at work in your life and in the world and just a better understanding of what that third person of the Trinity is all about. Absolutely. So Thanks. Oh, we, we hope that you are blessed <laughs> in the name of the Father, the Son, and, and. the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Thanks for listening, anywhere, everyone. Stay in peace. <laughs>